Okay, welcome everyone. We're delighted to have you join us this morning or afternoon, depending on what part of the country you might be joining us from um, for our Ask the Ask Experts Epidemiology webinar um, session today. I'd like to now briefly introduce you to our esteemed panelists this, um, for today's session um, and start with Dr. Anna diaz Brew, who is a Dean and Distinguished University Professor of Epidemiology at Dornsife School of Public Health at Drexel University, and she's also the director of Drexel Urban Health Collaborative. Um, next, we have Dr. Timothy Lash, um, who is the O. Wayne Rollins Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. He is also program leader um, for cancer prevention and control research program at the Winship Cancer Institute of Emory University. Um, and uh, our third panelist is Dr. Kirsten Bibbins Domingo, a professor and chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics here at UCSF. Um, she is also vice dean for population health and health equity, um, and uh, uh, the Lee Goldman uh, MD endowed professor of medicine, also here at UCSF. So please. Um, I uh, wish we could do sort of round of applause, but um, these are our esteemed panelists for today. I just also wanted to remind you of our uh, webinar objective. So we're really here to share our enthusiasm for epidemiology and population health with all of you. Um, for some people, COVID was their first exposure to epidemiology and the pandemic um, has uh, offered a powerful lens to view the role of epidemiology but we also want to give a sense of the wide array of topics and address your questions about pursuing advanced training in epidemiology today. So um, for our format uh, today, we're gonna start off, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves very briefly. Um, and I'm gonna ask them to touch on their research focus, what excites them about our work, and then um, three essential characteristics that they look for in epi trainings. So um, if I can ask Dr. diaz Rue to go ahead and um, start by introducing herself. Yes, hi everyone. I'm delighted to be here um, talking about epidemiology. Um, as Salma said, I'm currently the Dean at the Dornsife School of Public Health in Philadelphia. I I, uh, I'm an epidemiologist, although I'll tell you a little bit, I guess formally I'm not an epidemiologist. My degree is not in epidemiology, but I am an epidemiologist, I think. <laughs> so that's something we can talk about actually. Um, I trained originally as a pediatrician in Argentina where I'm from, and then I, I uh, saw the light of public health and I got some additional training in public health and then sort of ended up doing epidemiology. My research focus has been in the area of um, health inequities, um, looking in particular at the role of neighborhoods and community level factors in health and in how they contribute to differences in health across race and ethnic groups by socioeconomic characteristics, and also how the environment broadly understood to encompass things like air pollution, traditional environmental factors, but also the built environment, how the things we build around us, and also how our social environment affects our health and, and how that um, and, 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 and how that can be policy relevant in terms of the actions that we can take to promote health. More recently, I've been doing more work in, uh, in the area of health in cities in general and urban health with a more global perspective. Um, and in terms of the things that I look for in trainees, I, I would say uh, curiosity, that's a big one for me, curiosity. Epidemiology is a lot about figuring things out. So curiosity, um, the willingness to think broadly too and connect things that might not initially seem like they would be connected. I mean, uh, things about um, how the social environment affects the way our genes express themselves, for example. And also 
um, I think an interest in, you know, big social questions, um, things, challenges that we face as a society and how they connect to our health. So those are my, my three. Thank you so much, Dr. Lash. Yes, hello everyone. And uh, thanks for including me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm the chair of the Department of Epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health. Uh, we have a big department, uh, more than 40 faculty and about 300 MPH and MSPH students and 60 doctoral students. So it's a big department. Um, one of the things that excites me about epidemiology is the breadth of uh, backgrounds and experiences that people bring to it. Uh, Dr. Diaz Rue just explained that she started as a pediatrician. I started as a molecular biologist. Um, and we have statisticians and computer scientists and uh, anthropologists and people with all different types of backgrounds that find their way to epidemiology. And it's really a wonderful mixing pool for different ideas and different uh, research skills and analytic skills that then are brought to bear on the same set of questions. I, I've always found that really uh, appealing about epidemiology. Um, three things that I look for in um, trainees, uh, and I committed mine to writing, so I can say I, the first one's the same as the one Dr. diaz Rue mentioned, which is uh, curiosity. I think it's critical that you come to this with a uh, uh, a thirst for learning and, and sorting things out and figuring things out. And also oftentimes with curiosity comes a sense of humility and uh, uncertainty and uh, skepticism about your own work and what you read. And I think that's kind of travels together with curiosity and I think it's important. Uh, second is reliability. It's kind of a fundamental human trait, but we need, I need to work with people who I can count on to do what they'll, they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it and do it well. So I think that's um, important, but most people who are prepared for application to graduate training um, are have a history of being reliable. So I think that, but it is critical in any collaboration. It's a very collaborative science and people need to be able to work together and fundamental that is uh, being able to count on each other. Uh, and the third one that I wrote down is writing. Uh, you know, that's the currency of our field is um, the written word, whether it's grant applications or publications, textbook chapters, and it all comes down to being able to convey your ideas well in writing. And so um, I look for students who can, who have a demonstrated ability to write well. Thank you. And Dr. Bivens Domingo. Thank you, Dr. Sharif Marco. I um, so I love hearing my colleagues talk. So I have a little bit of a history that uh, that mirrors theirs. Um, I um, I uh, my PhD is also not in epidemiology. I started as a basic scientist in in uh, biochemistry, um, and then um, uh, I'm a physician. I am a general internist, and I still practice as a general internist. And um, and then got additional training. Um, uh, as I was uh, transitioning from being a fundamental scientist to actually um, doing epidemiology, which is what I do now. I mostly focus on cardiovascular disease prevention. Uh, I'm very interested in prevention broadly with a specific, um, specific focus on cardiovascular disease prevention and then thinking how we make sure our efforts at prevention reach um, our most marginalized communities, either by race or ethnicity or socioeconomic status. I think both in the clinical sphere as well as in the public health and policy sphere. And so, um, so I, I think about prevention fairly broadly. Um, I'm really fortunate. We, we have a, a big department uh, like Tim's, uh, like Dr. Lash's, uh, that um, we, are, we have a department of 90 faculty. Um, we're different than the other two, um, my other two colleagues in that we're in a, a, a school of medicine. We're not in a, a, a public health a school. Um, but I think that there's the interesting opportunity for us because we have many people thinking across uh, the sort of clinical public health, um, uh, what had been traditionally a divide, but I would argue is now and more and more coming closer together. And I think that's it's a real fun time to, to think in, in epidemiology uh, about uh, that sort of clinical uh, public health um, and, and the breadth of ways we think about health. 
Um, uh, I would uh, underscore the importance of uh, curiosity as the fundamental characteristic that, uh, that a trainee uh, should, uh, should possess before they are even thinking about a graduate program. That's what translates well uh, for these fields that really are broad and multidisciplinary and these questions that, that lend themselves to broad ways of thinking. I think of epidemiology, um, what I love about it is that it is very much a team sport. I'm learning all the time from my colleagues. And so I think the people who do well are the ones who, um, who are curious, who are committed to being very good at the things that they learn to do well, and then are committed to working in teams with other people and learning from each other. Um, and so those are the characteristics that I think are, are, um, I look for and are the things that pretend uh, success in this field. Thank you so much. I also realized as I asked each of you to introduce yourself that at the beginning I didn't introduce myself to the audience. So they're probably wondering who this is. Um, I apologize. I was just so excited to get going with our conversation today. Um, so my name is Salma Sharif Marco and I am an associate professor in the Department of Epi and Biostats here at UCSF. Um, so um, thank you for sharing your experiences. I think now um, I'm going to ask a series of questions. I'll direct them to one of you and then um, ask you, know, you to take three to four minutes to answer that question as best you can in that time. And then maybe uh, open it up to the panelists to add any additional comments that they may have that wasn't covered that were particularly um, relevant to the discussion. So Dr. diaz Ru, I'm gonna start with you and ask, uh, you alluded to this a little bit in your introduction, um, but how did you choose a career in epidemiology and how did you choose your research focus? You're on mute. As I, as I said, I, um, I trained as a pediatrician in Argentina. So I was doing my residency there and uh, and then I was working as chief resident. And over the course of my clinical training there, one of the things that we did as residents was rotate through these health centers in the out, outskirts of Buenos Aires, a very, very big city. And these health centers were located generally in very poor neighborhoods. And through that experience, it was a very, very intense experience. Um, the residents, we did everything. We sort of managed this huge public hospital, which was the only big public children's hospital in Argentina at the time. And it was, just became so obvious that there was so much happening in the lives of these children that we could not really do anything about with clinical practice. And so that created this, you know, interest in, in what was happening in the world that was affecting these children and their health and that we couldn't really fix through the, the medical approach. And so I got involved group, working with residents to organize these big meetings that we called, on, they were primary health care and social medicine. And that was my exposure to public health. Through that, I, I started to gain contact with people who were in public health and interdisciplinary, you know, from many, many disciplines, anthropologists, sociologists, um, economists, et cetera. And so that, um, that got me very excited about getting training in public health, and um, there wasn't, there weren't a lot of opportunities to get training in Argentina at that time. So, I ended up going to Johns Hopkins for my MPH, and and there it was a world that opened up, opened up for me. And um, I initially was in international health, and then I moved to health policy and management. And my PhD is actually in health policy and management, but I worked as an epidemiologist circumstantially. I just got involved working on a research study of cardiovascular, the ARIC study. Um, Kirsten probably knows this study. Uh, so I was a research assistant on this study and, 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 I, and, and the more I learned about epidemiology and how it combines the numbers with the other stuff was really fascinating to me. And so that's how I, you know, one thing led to another and I ended up doing epidemiologic research initially on cardiovascular disease, which I never thought as a pediatrician that I would do, but I, I worked on it a little bit because it was the, an opportunity and because it allowed me to bring in all these, cardiovascular disease is a great disease to think about the social world. And so, um, you know, I think in my case, it was uh, what I ended up working on was a combination of my interests and the circumstances that I was in and the opportunities that I had, but it all worked out because it put me on a path that uh, has been fascinating in terms of 
you know, thinking about epidemiology broadly and, and connecting epidemiology to policy and community action, et cetera, which is a, so important as COVID has shown us now. So, um, so that's, that's, that's my story. So not formally trained as an epidemiologist, but I took a lot of epi classes and I, and I ended up teaching a lot of epi. So you can get to epi in different ways. I guess that's what I'm saying. Thank you. We had a lot of questions about how to get to EPI, so I think this conversation hopefully will um, start to address some of those questions for our audience. Dr. Lash or Dr. Vivens Domingo, did you want to add anything um, about your personal path to EPI? Maybe not so much about the path to MB, but uh, path to my research focus. Um, I'm a cancer epidemiologist really clinical cancer epidemiologist focused on cancer outcomes, not so much cancer prevention. And, um, and that was partly just practicalities at the time that I was trying to sort out a research program or write my first grants. Um, you know, many people way smarter than me with way better access to resources than me had been trying to address breast cancer prevention, which is the cancer that I work in for many years and without much to show for it, frankly, which unfortunately remains the same now. Um, and I sort of realized that the chances of me being the one who does something important in breast cancer prevention or breast cancer etiology, uh, particularly without access to resources like the nurse's health study or so forth, you know, that just wasn't going to happen for me. Um, but breast cancer is fortunately very treatable cancer when detected early and um, is a really was way ahead of its time in uh, precision medicine or personalized medicine and anti-hormone therapy for ER positive cancers began in the 1980s. And so um, sorting out what molecular characteristics of the primary tumor likely portend successful treatment uh, has proven to be a very effective strategy for improving breast cancer outcomes. And I did have access to those resources and, and people who were thinking along those lines. And so um, like anything in life, there's the aspirational side, but there's also the practical side. And so I think that it's important to really think about what you're likely to be able to do well, given what resources you have access to. If I could just add one more thing for, for me, because I started, um, uh, my path to epi uh, started with being a clinician, but one that really had this strong scientific background with, with the basic scientists. Um, I realized that as a clinician, I was very interested in um, how I could improve the health for an individual patient, but I became curious about, well, what was it we don't know and what, what could I learn that would help me in the next patient? So it was much more about translating my focus from the individual patient to groups of patients that are like that patient. And, um, and I think that's, that is fundamentally what, uh, what epidemiology helps you as uh, gives you the tools if you come at this from the clinical side, you have a grounding in lots of the disease processes we're talking about, but really understanding it to get to um, understand uh, the factors that influence um, the development of disease or outcomes of the disease by other types of characteristics of the individual groups of individuals, the environments that they're in, I think it is, is that, is that, is that is that cure drive that epidemiology can help you uh, to, to fill. And I think that's, uh, that's what got me here. Thank you, Dr. Vivens Domingo. I'm gonna actually stay with you for the next question because I think it sort of builds nicely about thinking about how, you know, the opportunities um, that led you guys to become these leading epidemiologists. Um, but now to think about, you know, for our audience, potential students um, or people who are thinking about transitioning into epidemiology, what should they look for in training programs or academic homes or non-academic homes, you know, um, as they think about their career? Right, for, for me, I, I, I would be looking for programs that, um, that have a strong track record for mentoring and training students. And that is having a, a group of faculty 
uh, for whom students are, are an integral part of the way they think about the work in, in that department. Um, because I, my belief, maybe not shared by everyone, my belief is that the most important thing that you're doing during graduate training is learning your, is um, honing your craft, learning your skills from, uh, from someone or a group of people who are expert in that area and can help you to do that. That's more important probably even than the specific content area that you're working in. Um, because I think all of our careers, as you've heard here, move in multiple different directions. And what you have to have, though, is a set of skills and a way of understanding how to ask and answer a research question. And that you get from learning from a good research team with a good mentor and a program that's really committed to students more than that they have specific content expertise necessarily in the one specific thing you might end up doing in the future in your career. Thank you. Dr. diaz Rue, did you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I would just endorse the, the, the top of my list would also be the mentorship in the program. So, you know, who are the mentors that you might work with there? Um, how do you fit in that world? And uh, is, is it a, an environment that incorporates students actively into the research? Because a lot that you will learn I mean, you'll certainly learn a lot in your courses, but a lot will also be kind of an apprenticeship thing where you get involved and see how people do research and, and, and how they work in teams. Because as Dr. Lash was saying, also, this is a very much of a team discipline, um, interdisciplinary teams all the time. So experiencing that, so the opportunity to have a mentor or mentors and, and, uh, and engage with them, I think that's the most important thing probably. Dr. Lash, did you want to add anything else? Sure, I, I completely agree about the importance of mentoring and the team that you'll work with. Um, I'll add one thing that's a little bit aspirational and one thing that's a little bit practical. Uh, aspirationally, when you join a program, you're joining a community and um, people flourish and prosper and are satisfied when the communities that they're in our communities of shared values. So I think um, you ought to be able to identify what the values are of the place and whether they're your values. Uh, because if your values are out of sync with people you're around, then you will not be happy or productive. So in our department, we talk about integrity, rigor, ambition, collegiality, and inclusion. That's, the, these, that's our department's values. And we live them and we state them and we're clear about them. It surprises me how many places I go to that can't don't have a description, you know, that this is what we care about. So um, I encourage students to think about that, you know, are, are my values aligned with the values of this program? Because if they are, you're going to be happy and you'll be productive. Practically, I'll pay forward the advice that I got when I was thinking about graduate programs, uh, which was to choose a place where you want to live, <laughs> because you're not going to be very rich while you're <laughs> In graduate school, and um, you know, if you're if you're living someplace where there's not the opportunities for outdoor uh, exercise or music scene or restaurants, you know, if the, if, if you're not going to be happy living there, it's going to make it a chore to be in graduate school. So, do think about whether you want to live where the school is that you're applying to. Can I just add on to what Dr. Lash just said? I, I actually totally agree with the practical and I just want to underscore that for people who are looking very broadly and I think it's great to look broadly. I mean, I love that we, I get to be here with my colleagues across uh, the country at really outstanding programs. I do think that there is a practical aspect, you know, that that um, graduate school happens when lots of life is happening. Um, for me, I, um, I got married and had my son during medical school. And so for me, all of my choices were really around where was my family going to be? Where were the people who were going to support me? And so in addition to the environment you'd love to live in, I think you have to think about the other supports you have around you for the life that happens along the way with these great graduate programs. Because um, I think we shouldn't think of, you know, what do you do? And, and then your life starts after you finish your graduate program. You have to be in a place where your life continues along the way. And for many people that you, you should think about that as you're making decisions as well. There are a couple of questions that have come up from our participants that I want to use as 
um, follow up to this conversation. So one is around data science and how important it is to consider um, a training program that has or includes, you know, data science or an institution that has some expertise in data science. Um, and then related, I think, is this, uh, the conversation has uh, certainly pointed to the fact that you are all involved in interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary research. And so um, a question around is the expectation for future generations of epidemiologists to be experts in epi, experts in multiple disciplines? You know, how do you, um, how can they think about navigating that? And I will let um, any panelists who would like to <laughs> respond right away, or um, maybe I'll call on Dr. diaz -Rue then. Oh, Dr. Lash, I see you've turned off your mute. Uh, sure, it's not Jeopardy. I didn't mean to ring in before anyone else. So um, I think data science is important and I hope that epidemiologists uh, incorporated into their training programs. I, I think many are. Uh, my larger concern is that if we don't incorporate data science into our training programs, then the epidemiology that makes use of data science will be owned by computer scientists and others. And I can predict the list of mistakes that they'll make. They'll be plagued by immortal time biases and misclassification errors and prediction, mistaken as causation, lessons that we learned in other settings using other data sources long ago. So I, I think it's very important as much as anything to ring fence epidemiology from people who will otherwise make predictable mistakes. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I, 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 I think we're having on our campus a really wonderful, robust discussion about this back and forth. I think I think that um, that uh, rather than us being at different sides of the um, on different sides of the fence throwing stones at each other that you know cool stuff is the data science and the old stuff is epidemiology data science is just a, a set of tools and ultimately our disciplines of epidemiology are, are um, have been used to for for decades centuries like incorporating new tools into helping us to understand disease processes better. And so um, I think that um, I think on our campus, we, we have a, a wonderful computational health sciences institute and uh, thinking jointly about how we develop programs that um, it, I think has really stimulated a very good discussion and that I think is important. Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the really, at least for me, the really interesting thing about epidemiology is that it's at the intersection, right, of the data you know, the data science, the, the social sciences, the biology and the biomedical piece. And so to me, it's about integrating all of that. And I think, you know, in your training, I mean, obviously getting trained in sort of solid epidemiologic methods is fundamental and it's the most important thing. But then within that, you know, one, you know, you'll be able to also learn things it, over the course of your career. So it's not like you have to get everything <laughs> during your graduate program. You have to get a foundation that then you can build on. Um, and uh, so I think there are many ways that you can get that foundation. So I guess I'm, I'm not sure there's like a checklist of things, you know, for each program. It's more about like, you know, are you going to get some, you know, ba so basic solid training in epidemiology that will then allow you to do other things over the course of your career. Um, you know, there are many tools now, um, research methods from the social sciences or economics that epidemiologists are, you know, some of them we've done for a long time, we call them differently, but use different terminology, but also we're now also adopting some tools that perhaps we weren't using as much for things like policy evaluation or natural experiments and things like that. And so I think um, thinking broadly uh, is really important. Thank you. Um, so our next question um, is, um, I think one that we have many uh, uh, participants asking about or, or um, around. So this is um, bringing it back to this current year and the pandemic that we're facing. 
Um, and so we wanted to ask you um, to comment on, you know, how COVID has impacted your work um, and what has maybe surprised you the most about um, the epidemiology of COVID-19. So I'll start with Dr. Lash. Uh, sure, thank you. So um, how has the pandemic impacted my work? So uh, in terms of my own research program, not very much. It's, we, you know, our, um, my funded research program is largely um, in a data analysis phase and not a data collection phase, so, so not much. But I will say that as chair of a department, it's affected a lot. Uh, you know, in mid-March, we had 22 classes that had to pivot to remote instruction. Uh, we had to plan for a fall semester and now spring semester in this hybrid, largely remote setting. Coach up faculty to teach remotely, coach up students to learn remotely. Um, and the pandemic in our workspace, as in the larger society, has just magnified everything. All of the disparities that were and inequities that were already in place have been magnified by the pandemic, even in our work setting. And I, you know, I see faculty and students who have dependent care concerns really struggling to keep up and uh, trying to encourage them that it's, that it's okay, that it's understandable. And of course, the home life comes first. Um, so I would say that the effect on my work has been by primarily in my role as chair. Um, in terms of what has surprised me about the epidemiology, well, what I'll say is what's, what has surprised me and pleasantly surprised me is um, not the epidemiology, but the epidemiologists. The uh, infectious disease epidemiologists have pivoted so rapidly and so impressively to take on this pandemic. Uh, you know, there were not many at all working in coronavirus, um, certainly many working in respiratory infectious diseases. Uh, but I've seen people on our faculty, you know, leading. Um, projects at the nexus of applied public health and academic public health. Uh, we've had faculty who are um, literally manning COVID testing sites and helping with the um, outbreaks in meat packing plants in North Georgia and um, urban Fulton County, Atlanta. Um, Ben Lopeman wrote a model to help the university understand what to plan for in the fall, which they then turned into a shiny app and made freely available for colleges and universities that don't have schools of public health or the kind of expertise that they could lend so they can model their own plans. You know, and that's all just super impressive to me that they have stepped up that rapidly and really, you know, set aside their own research agenda to uh, help with the society's response to the pandemic. It's been remarkable and inspirational. Thank you, Dr. Lash. Uh, Dr. Diaz Rue, would you like to comment on this question next? Sure. Um, so I think what has been amazing about the COVID situation, well, one of the things, so many things have been amazing in so many different ways, but. Uh, has been how epidemiology has been in the media. You know, it, it's just been amazing to see people talk about rates and, you know, the difference between counts and rates. Once we were having breakfast and I told my husband, oh my God, this guy on the radio, he's explaining positive predictive value. You know, it was like, I was like, wow, look at this. <laughs> you know, it's like sort of the nerdy epidemiologist. This is amazing. So, uh, but, you know, more seriously, I think also, I mean, and certainly a lot of discussion about infectious disease epidemiology and, you know, herd immunity and, you know, all this, uh, but also um, the, the conversation that has been sort of launched about the epidemiology of health inequities, you know, and, and the, the causes of that, you know, that has been the role of racism and structural racism, inequality, and the incredible, you know, discussions of that in the media has, have just been amazing. Uh, and, uh, and I hope will lead to, you know, some, some, you know, some changes, some transformations in the way we think about the causes of health, ill health and what we should do about them. 
So that has been incredible uh, to see. In terms of um, my own work, well, certainly, um, obviously, a, a administrative issues, but I'm not going to talk about those. But in terms of the, the research and the work itself, we have been, I'll give you some one example of some of the ways that we have, uh, you know, shifted our work uh, in many ways. Uh, we were, we have a partnership through the Urban Health Collaborative at our school with the Big Cities Health Coalition, which is a a coalition of the 30 biggest US cities. Um, uh, we're working with the De Beaumont Foundation uh, with, on, 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 with, on the coalition. And uh, very quickly, we were asked to put together a data dashboard on COVID inequities in cities so that the cities can look at how inequities in their city compared to other cities, for example. Um, and so we've been rapidly pivoting to do that. We've also in some of our urban health work, we've been, we have a big study in Latin America called Salud Urbana en America Latina, Urban Health in Latin America with many different countries. And we've quickly put together data so that we can look at how city characteristics or neighborhood characteristics within cities uh, predict COVID um, outcomes. So to, to, provide, to provide some information that might be useful for policymakers and for um, public health practitioners in these cities. So, we have you know, shifted you know, our, our work quite a bit to try to respond to the needs. And that has been challenging and a lot of work, but also incredibly interesting um, and important, I think, to do. Great. Um, I think Dr. Shreve Marco just dropped off, but I, this, is, this is a great area. I, you know, when, when COVID uh, first hit, um, I, um, I'm not an infectious disease epidemiologist. Um, I, I mostly was focused, um, and so I thought, well, I'm sitting this one out. I'm, I'm figuring out how our institution responds and our department responds, all of the administrative tasks. I'm a clinician, so I was very much focused on what, how we are uh, re-juggling our clinical care. And then, of course, you know, as the as the deep inequities emerged, uh, then it was clear that that there was a lot more, a lot to talk about um, and a lot to think about how we, um, uh, you know, what what is necessary. We need the infectious disease epidemiologists, but we actually need so many of the the disciplines that make up schools of public health and and departments of epidemiology. Um, and and in my on my campus, really um, thinking across uh, many of our clinical and 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 basic in in terms of our response. So I I, um, I actually was fortunate enough to to um, to be asked by our chancellor to lead our uh, COVID community public health initiative, which was really uh, thinking about how we can do uh, rapid uh, rapidly launch um, uh, studies in communities to really help guide both community and public health response. Uh, so we have been doing testing in the communities that are most effective. We did this very early on already in April uh, to show the high rates um, in our Latino community. We have 50, uh, our Latinx community makes up about 15% of the population in San Francisco, but well over 50% of the cases. Um, and we we did um, we did uh, very uh, I think really nice and timely work um, showing um, uh, just the high burden in this community, the high burden of asymptomatic uh, individuals, um, people who are working outside the home, low wage, uh, frontline workers as the risk factor, transmission in dense housing, um, all of these types of things that really helped guide. Um, both our public health response and changes in policy locally, as well as, um, as well as, uh, you know, helped empower community uh, uh, leadership. We did this all in partnership with the communities uh, to to advocate for changes in policy, like changes that led to uh, protection of wages while people are isolating uh, after being positive. And we've now done these across um, both San Francisco and Oakland. In uh, particularly, our Latinx community has been particularly. Uh, affected, but also in African American and in our homeless populations. And I think it's been this great um, model of what is both um, what an academic institution can provide at this time, right? So this is about, um, it is it is about service for sure, but it is also about collecting data um, that really has helped inform um, uh, the public health departments that have ended up changing some of their policies around testing and things like that, but also, um, but also uh, empowering communities with data to advocate for policies that are that ended up uh, being important 
uh, for this. So for me, it's been great because it always it just reminds me how resilient these tools are and uh, to actually apply to, to to something new. And then you know, for someone like. Uh, me who's interested in health disparities, um, that, that seems to be a, an ever-present uh, thing. We're involved now with the state also to think about how we can have a, a modeling consortium across our institutions across the state um, to do, uh, well, many people are doing modeling, but I'm very interested in how uh, the academic modeling that we're doing is linked more closely with the people who have to make decisions, the policymakers, and how we can bring uh, those things more in more close alignment so people are actually modeling in more real time with the people who have to make decisions. And I think that's what our opportunity is. In my day job before COVID, I was doing disparities, but also mostly focused on hypertension. Turns out hypertension is a big risk factor uh, for, for outcomes from COVID. Um, it turns out the disparities in hypertension are there. And it also turns out even before COVID, we were doing worse in terms of our overall blood pressure control in the US. So there's lots that has continued on that is not COVID related. And as we get our pandemic under control, I think that um, you know there, there will be plenty to do uh, uh, in all of the other health conditions that, that we're interested in. The last thing that I would say is, and this relates to uh, uh, what Dr. Desru uh, said, is, is just um, the amazing thing to see epidemiology in, um, in the media. And I think in our department, we've had a lot of discussions about the importance of science communication. And we've had several of our faculty who are very prominent in the media. They, they're doing media and public education all the time. But even our epidemiologists who are not infectious disease epidemiologists have played a role in their communities to help sort of uh, just put better messaging out there. So all of a sudden, when epidemiology was cool, everybody was an armchair epidemiologist. And so what we tried to encourage our department is that, like, you guys are real, like, you know, card-carrying epidemiologists, and so you might as well be out there talking about uh, about the numbers and and whether that's in in you know educating in your community circles or or in the media. I think there's been a, an increasing role for people, even if it's not talking into the deep vaccinology or whatever it is. It's but but helping make sense of the numbers, which is ultimately what what we have to do throughout this pandemic. Welcome Thank back, you so much. Teresa Marco. <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> uh, technology sometimes is not our friend. <laughs> uh, so I'm happy I was able to join back in. And um, so we do have some uh, questions, I think, that build nicely from uh, your reactions and responses to uh, the questions and comments on COVID. Um, so I think many of you are aware and probably have uh, read and maybe also written or responded to some of the discussion around science and activism. And so I'd like to sort of go there next to, to get your thoughts about how you think um, epidemiologists should participate or engage in activism. Um, and um, I'll jump in. Um, so, uh, so my uh, my personal view on this is, and and I think a, a lot about this. My 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 personal view on this is that um, is that um, epidemiologists all have a response. All scientists have a responsibility to ask important questions and questions that are timely and that move the science forward, but also have have. Um, in, in my view, um, are, are important for helping ultimately to move our understanding of health forward, right? So asking important relevant questions, not just a question that could give you a publication, I think is actually our responsibility as science. So this, I think it's also our responsibility to communicate effectively so that people can make sense of findings that we have so that uh, we can translate that to help others make sense of how they could use those findings. Um, I, the questions I choose to ask relate very clearly to the things that I would like to be changed in, in society. They very clearly do. Um, my approach to asking, to addressing those questions though has to be grounded in the same type of skepticism, objectivism, scientific rigor. And that's, and I wanna work with colleagues who are going to push me on those things. I want to have my publications 
published in the highest peer reviewed journals that I can so that others can question my findings. So I'm very clear what I wanna change in society, what I wanna change to improve health. But I, but I use the tools that I have and the collaborations that I have to, with a healthy degree of skepticism to knock down my pre-existing ideas for how we might get there. Because what I'd like to change is clear, how we get there, I'm open to a lot of different ways to getting there. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, that's the challenge. One of my colleagues likes to say that um, uh, scientists make the stones and then they give them to the advocates to throw. And so, uh, so the thing that I think is important is that I have, I, I, I want to be asking the question in a way that I can uh, make good stones uh, for people who are going to be more on the front lines and throwing the stones. That's my, that's my role. And that's how I see my role uh, for asking important questions. Thank you. Dr. Diaz Rue, would you like to Take a turn. Yes, uh, yes. I, 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 I agree with what Dr. Bivens Domingo was saying uh, fully. I think um, this issue of uh, you know what questions we choose to focus on is is so important, um, and uh, and I think uh, I, I agree that we do have a responsibility as scientists to ask important questions. At the same time, I think you know there's a continuum of questions, and some people will focus on questions that have more of a uh, the answers to the questions have a more direct implication for action immediately, and, and some will focus on questions that are more like basic science that will eventually lead to change, you know, to other uh, changes. So I think, you know, and, and there within epidemiologists, there's a broad, you know, it's a it's a broad range of kinds of questions that people might focus on. Uh, but for those of us who do focus perhaps on questions that are more related to the immediate sort of translation. I do think we absolutely have to answer them with answer them with the maximum scientific rigor. I mean, that's critical because otherwise the answer is worthless. And so I think answering the questions with the utmost rigor and then um, explaining what we found, <laughs> which we often don't do very well as scientists. I think we're all learning. Uh, I have certainly learned a lot about that. Uh, in, you know, in my current role where I speak to a lot of people about public health in more general ways. So I think communicating our findings in ways that are understandable and from which the implications flow. Um, and then you know, uh, sharing them with those who, you know, with the public and also with, with those who are in, in, in decision-making uh, positions. But I think you know, sometimes our answers may change the way people think about the drivers of health. And that's really important too, because that opens up a whole other range of advocacy that is, you know, beyond what we as individual scientists can do, but it's something that the public can do, right? When sort of their eyes are opened up to what is driving health in communities, which sometimes people are not uh, aware of really, some of the profound impact on health that some of these more social or economic or environmental factors can have. Um, so that's, I, I just wanna follow up because that was another question that's come up in our uh, Q&A today is around the role of epidemiology to address upstream and uh, upstream factors and structural change uh, related to those upstream factors and sort of, you know, um, I think yeah, those factors are, yeah, I think those factors are, you know, uh, critical to health and we absolutely have to study them and understand their impacts so that we understand, you know, the broad range of policies that are available to us to improve health and not focus on the exclusively on the more narrow biomedical world exclusively. At the same time, as I said, you know, there will be some epidemiologists who work at look at upstream or uh, distal social factors and other epidemiologists who are more focusing on more mechanistic things. And that's that's fine. We need everyone. Um, and then we kind of need to put it together, right? Because that's how that's how sort of we can transform knowledge of the drivers of population health and then lead to new actions. So thank you. And Dr. Lash. Uh, yeah, I, I maybe just a couple nuances to fill in um, that I think that the degree to which a scientist chooses to be an advocate might in part depend on the maturity of the science. 
Godfrey Oakley in our department is a tireless advocate for folate supplementation of grains, which the science is very mature that that reduces the occurrence of neural tube defects. Mm -hmm. uh, when a scientific topic's not so well established, scientists who choose to be early on the advocacy are putting themselves in a risky position, I think. And, and so I think that requires there's no one answer. For me, I think thinking about where we are in discovery to implementation for the particular topic informs how involved scientists might choose to be as advocates. Um, as for consequentialism, this is something I've thought a lot about and written a little bit. Um, you know, consequentialism is consequence to who? Right. Who did, I worked on a paper early in my collaboration with Denmark on um, birth outcomes in melanoma survivors. Um, you know, there's not a lot of people are diagnosed with melanoma. Most who are diagnosed with melanoma are beyond the age at which they're thinking about completing families. Uh, but for a woman and her physician who's trying to decide about choosing to uh, try to become pregnant as a melanoma survivor, this is really important, right? So um, to them, it's really important. It's not many of those people, but it's really important. So I'm, I'm not as much, uh, I think you have to ask important questions and answer them well, but I am also less uh, than some reading I've done who, who really advocate for only looking at big problems that affect a substantial portion of the population. I'm, I'm, if that's consequentialism, then I'm not fully on board. Yeah, and I let me just say, I totally agree with, with my colleagues. I think when I say important, I, I say important questions and I, I think we can define that in a, in a whole range of ways. I, I definitely don't think we only need to have um, uh, people working on the things that have the highest population attributable, uh, you know, uh, factors related to, to a particular outcome. That, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I do think, though, that um, uh, for me, I, I think of advocacy broadly. So, I, so do, I, do I want to make sure for me uh, that, um, that all communities have the chance to live the healthiest life we can live here in the U.S.? Absolutely. I am a strong advocate for that. My science is about figuring out the specific ways in which that specific um, reasons that explain the differential rates we see and the particular ways in which certain policies uh, might alleviate those. And I have a responsibility as a scientist to be very objective about that and actually help skeptical about that. That doesn't change my overall advocacy to ensure that, um, that uh, people have the opportunity to live the healthiest life possible. And if that's not happening, then we have to understand that. And so I'm taking it probably at the broadest possible way we think about um, advocacy. Um, it does, I, it is a, such an important question because it comes into potential conflict as you talk about the partners that you have, or as you talk like Dr. Lash talks about um, the, the drive for a particular scientific question answered for a particular patient or, or advocates for a particular policy solution. And one of the challenges for scientists who work in, in, in arenas like this is to figure out how do you, um, the pace of science and the manner of doing science is oftentimes at odds with what advocates are doing. Um, and you have to be willing to say, well, actually, I would like to solve homelessness, but that problem, that particular policy solution, as we study it here, doesn't suggest that that policy solution is the answer. And you have to be able to say that as a scientist working in an arena with in partners like that. That's it, it, essential because our, our credibility as scientists relies on that. And it, it also, that is, it's that same credibility when something is shown to work that actually can help move a field forward if you're also working with people who can, who can work at the policy levers to bring about change. Thank you so much. Um, so as I had imagined, this hour goes by very well, was going to go by very quickly. Um, we have still a lot more questions from our part, uh, participants. Um, so I 
want to end by asking one, I think that um, it's a good one to end on perhaps. Um, so we have a couple questions related to how you might have stayed motivated and focused early on in your academic careers, um, despite rigor and competitive nature of funding, publishing, et cetera. And um, related to that, I think, um, how do you take care of your mental health, especially um, given current times and context? So I'll start with Dr. Lash on that one. I'm going to punt on the first one because frankly, I'm not a very good model for self-care. <laughs> so uh, just admit it. <laughs> um, early in my career and even now, I just think this is fun. I mean, I enjoy it. And so uh, I have not had to uh, find strategies to be motivated. I like coming to work. I like the people I work with. I love working with the students. You know, it has not been hard for me to stay motivated, and, and that's a privilege. I recognize it. Um, so I'm sorry that I don't have good answers to either question, but at least I can admit that I don't. That's still an answer. <laughs> um, Dr. diaz Um Yeah, I'm not sure if this will fully answer the question, but one, one thing that I did almost, I, I'm not, it, I, it just happened to me sort of, but retrospectively, it turned out to be really helpful is that I had a piece of the stuff that I was doing that was more traditional, you know, classic, you know, in my case, it was more cardiovascular disease epidemiology, you know, pretty traditional, a, a little, a, maybe a little bit different because I was looking more at social things. But, but then on the other side, I was thinking about um, multi-level things and complex systems. And, and so I had these, and that was maybe not something that was going to get funded, but it was something that kept me thinking sort of. And so that was kind of nice to have these two pieces, one that was a little more traditional, interesting, but a little more traditional. And then something that was more, a little risky, a little more risky, a little out there, but that gave me, you know, a lot of, uh, energy. And, uh, so, so that's, that helped me balance a little bit and focus uh, as well. Yeah, and yeah, and I, I'm, I'm a generalist, so generalist problem is focus. And so, um, but I, I will say what, um, what has kept me going and what I, I love about this is that, um, is the ability to work on at different points in my career, a range of different research questions. And so right now I'm working on the things that for me, I can contribute to uh, what's what's important right now in, in, in the set of things going on. Um, and I, I think the ability to, uh, to work on different questions at different times for, with different groups of people has been one of those things that I found particularly uh, rewarding and um, and energizing and um, and you know and I yeah I, I think I think that's been great and I've stayed at the place where my husband and son are and um, and so I have my family around me and so you know being able to work on a range of questions in an area where you know my personal life is is also, uh, you know, uh, they're also doing well. I think, I think that's been, that's, you know, that's just a wonderful reward, you know? Well, thank you. I um, have to wrap us up now, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I would really like to thank our panelists today, Dr. Vivens Domingo, Dr. Diaz Ru, and Dr. Lash for your time and for your wonderful insights about epidemiology. Um, and your own experiences. It's been wonderful to hear and chat with you. I'd also like to thank um, the people sort of in the background here who really made today's session um, possible. Um, Pam Murnin, Eva Wong Moy, Haley Reeves, Kimmy Amin, uh, um, and uh, Benjamin Wallen for helping us put this seminar together. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone um, of our audience and participants for attending our webinar and asking your questions um, in the Q&A and allowing us to um, respond to them. So um, I hope you all have a wonderful Friday afternoon and uh, stay safe and healthy. Thanks bye bye. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.